Y'all got that sheet of paper? Hang on to it for the next two months. You're going to need it. That is everything I'm going to be preaching on with the Scriptures, with the important... I, 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 this book here is called Oral Roberts University, The Holy Spirit in the Now. This is a textbook for that, that Robert G. Voigt, Ph.D. Uh, he taught the class. And it was, wow, it was just an eye-opening adventure. And uh, what I want to do is to uh, kind of use this as the backdrop of what I'm going to be doing. And I'm going to be covering these uh, principles of the Holy Spirit. And uh, what I want us to see is Pentecost Sunday is coming, the 19th. And what I want you to know is that this represents the coming of the Holy Spirit of God into the world. And this is the big picture. God broke into history. The history of man without God. And God took Abraham, a man who just... He believed in God and he, he, it was like he was the only human that seemed to care about God and that God, God had revealed himself from Adam to Noah and now to Abraham and God had showed the human race. Hey, I, I'm God. I made this stuff. For you, but you rejected me. And you rejected what I have done for you. And so now I've got to reinstitute what I'm doing to you. And so he did, and, and through Noah, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob being Israel, the twelve tribes, the unity of the people of God in 12 tribes. And God took these 12 tribes and cleaned out the promised land and made it suitable for God to come in His presence in the Holy of Holies. But Israel had to go through the process of getting clean. So God gave Israel the law. Israel took the law and and basically rejected it. And through their process, God called them up to the mountain. They left Egypt by the Passover. And a period of time later, Israel experienced God calling them up to the mountain of God that was smoking and fire and thunder and all kinds of weird stuff going on. And Israel said, hey, hey look, God, you're scaring us to death. Why don't you just tell Moses what you want and then we'll do it? And so that's in a sense what happened that was Israel's Pentecost. Pentecost is when God wanted His people to be His people, to do His will, to, to be there for the world to show forth God. But Israel didn't understand. And for 2,000 years, God showed up with Israel, and Israel was the people of God, and God made it clear to them that you've got to attend these three feasts, Passover, Pentecost, 
and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the Feast of Atonement is in that one. And God is, you know, it's like Israel just saw the religious applications. We're going to do all the religious stuff and this is what we're going to do. And so ultimately God was trying to prepare the world for his son who was to come. Well, Jesus came, but he died on the cross and shed his blood. That was the Passover. And then 50 days later, the Holy Spirit was to come. Now, all of this took place and, and Israel was God's people. And, and in essence, they said, no, we're not going to, in a sense, believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And so God gave them 40 years to repent, and Israel did not repent. And so Israel was no more. Now, what is this invisible God going to do to continue the revelation of his presence with the human being, that the human race would be what God intended man to be all along. Now that's, that's kind of the overview of the Old Testament in preparation for the new. And Jesus came and said, it's, it's important for you to know that I've got to go. Because if I don't go, he cannot come. Who's he? God. His spirit. He, God is spirit. Now, the, God can be in heaven. God can be on the earth. God can be in any location in this universe. Jesus says that he sustains the universe by the word of his power. So the word of his power holds it all together. I mean, it's kind of like, wow, that, that makes sense. I, I, can, I can see that. And that's the process I made. I, that sounds reasonable. I can understand what God has done in Christ. He's made the human race capable of being holy. Oh, holy. I'm holy. Lord, you haven't been following me around this week. <laughs> I've been saying things, doing things. And so we each fall into that category. Not, Lord, we're not worthy. We're not, we don't qualify. And God said, do you believe in me? Well, yeah, of course I do. Do you believe in Jesus? Well, yes. Yes, Lord, we know He came, He died, He rose, He sits at the right hand of the God. We just said it in the book. It, it, we quoted that. He said, okay, if you understand that, then you are holy. You have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so all of this, Israel was kind of like, what in the world? is going on. This, this doesn't conform with our understanding of God. And so Jesus said, let me correct you in some of the things you don't understand. And Jesus corrected the religious institutions. And He prepared those who were there to receive the Spirit of God. And we read last week the account Luke gives of Pentecost. The 120 were sitting up there in, in the upper room doing what Jesus said. You, He had 10 days for them to pray and fast and seek God and be ready. The Holy Spirit's coming. Get ready. Well, on the day of Pentecost at 9 o'clock in the morning, 
the Holy Spirit fell. It did not fall the way people thought it should have. God coming, um, a rushing mighty wind, people speaking in tongues, telling the story of Jesus in their own language. Uh, this is all too foreign to us, Lord. And so now you are about to receive this, the spirituals. And, and the spirituals were thinking, what does that mean? And so the church, which is the book of Acts, was just learning what the Holy Spirit of God coming to earth looks like. Just like Israel said, you know, God, you're scaring us to death. The mountain smoking. Well, here they had tongues of fire. They had winds blowing that didn't cause any damage. And so all of this is happening. But the New Testament is the way the Holy Spirit looks after 30 or 40 years of operation in the world. That's in every country that Jesus took His people, they experienced the Holy Spirit in all of His doing. And so what the New Testament ends up being is this. This is what the Holy Spirit looks like on paper. Oh, okay. So we see God, Jesus, and the Spirit. This will be a Bible study on... Uh, we're going to dissect the Holy Spirit in us. How it works, what we're doing. But there's a progression. And I'm going to start with in, in your fold, in your book there, paper. In Ephesians 4, we'll start with verse 7. This is what Jesus gave to the church. How do we know that? Well, it says it right there. But to each one of us, grace, charis, grace, the gift of God. Charis was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So the grace of God was given to the measure of Christ's gift. What in the world does that mean? You know, I, I read these things and I'm, I'm thinking, I, I don't understand. This is beyond my natural understanding. Lord, you've got to open our minds to see what we're talking about. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended? Wait a minute. He who ascended, he first descended what what does that mean into the lower parts of the earth well for us that's this and this this is heaven this is beneath the earth down there and so we think in in earthly terms because we're material human beings and we're subject to the senses that we have and we don't find a place for there or here so we describe it as the lower parts of the earth 
Well, that's not where it is. It just isn't there with him. But he's got a place where those who have died go. And he went, they went down to the lower place. The place that isn't in heaven yet. Because that hasn't been prepared yet. Jesus hasn't made a place for them yet up there. So there's a general place where those go who have died. Not hell. It's, it's kind of a keeping place. We don't know. God doesn't give us a manual to explain some things. So we, we have to dig it out and find it. So that's where we are right now. We've got heavens there. Beneath the earth is there. But that's not really where it is. Heaven is right there. If, if the veil of this earth was removed, we would see the throne of God right there. We would see Jesus at his right hand. That's real. This isn't real. This is all going to perish. It's temporary. But that's real. That's forever. So is this. What is this? This is the place where those go who die. Now, Jesus came and he led captivity captive. He went down and preached and said, those of you who believe that these scars will give you eternal life, come with me. And the rest of you just keep on keeping on. And so he, he led those to, to come with it. And it says they roamed around the streets of Jerusalem and then they ascended to the place that Jesus had for them. So all of that is going on in this passage. He goes in, he takes and leads a, a hope. All those who are to, and this is going back to uh, Abel, to Enoch, to all of those, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, David, all those who had died and we're now waiting for the redemption to come in Christ. And those who were waiting saw the hands and they knew this is it. The blood of Jesus Christ gives eternal life. Abraham showed it. Noah showed it. Enoch told about it. So all of these Old Testament, New Testament, everybody was ready for the blood of Jesus. That's what they were looking for. So when he said this, they knew and they went with him. And he there took them to the place and then he ascended to the Father. All right. Now this he ascended... What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is also the one who ascended far above our earthly heavens that he might fill all things. Okay, so... He's, he went up there so that he could fill all things. What does that mean? It means that God wants to restore the human race to what it was before the fall of Adam. That's what filling all things is about. When the human race is being what God intended it to be. And he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles. We've got 24 named apostles in the Bible. 
in the New, in the New Testament. There's 24 named people that are potentially the apostles. Now, in Revelation, it said there were 12, there were 24 thrones. And some people say it's these apostles that are the ones. But I believe that it's the 12 patriarchs and the 12 disciples. Those are the 24 thr seats around the throne. So I'm going to, that's my own interpretation. But he said, some to be apostles, those who have seen Jesus. That's kind of what the definition is. And some prophets. Now, here, here's another element. Prophets. What Fourth telling what's going to be. Now, here's a problem Israel had. They had the temple. They had the sacrifice. They came and they shed blood and they atoned for their sins, but they were also just in case there's more to this God than what the blood accounts for. We're going to sacrifice to these idols just in case. We don't want to offend any deities out there that are there. And so uh, we're going to build a little tabernacle over here for the sun gods and the moon gods and the Mars gods and the Venus gods. And we're going to just cover all of our bases. God said, I ain't going to cut it. I'm the only God. Prophets, where did they come from? They're not a part of the temple. In the Old Testament, the prophets were outside of the cultic experience. These were people, humans, who had received the Spirit that were dictating what God said to them. They were people filled with the Spirit to bring Israel back to where God wanted them to be. That's, that's good theology. That's Old Testament theology. That's what the prophets were. They, what, they did not want people to come to them. They wanted people to come to, G, to God through the blood of Jesus. And that's what all the prophets talk about the Word of God. And that's where the prophets in the Old Testament differed from the priests who went into the temple. So this prophet continues in the New Testament. Apostles were like the founding fathers. Prophets, evangelists, those who go out and, and tell people about the Word of God. The truth about God is this. That's what the evangelist talks about. And some to be pastors and teachers. Pastors are, I'm going to get into that in just a few seconds, what pastor's role is. Teachers are those who come and, and teach us the Word of God. I do a lot of teaching in my preaching. I want us to know the Word of God. Not Roy, not the Methodist Church, but the Word of God. So he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, that, that is sometimes referred to as the fivefold ministry that Jesus gave to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What are they for? Verse 12 says, for the equipping of the saints. Who are the saints? The Catholic Church says we have to decide who the saints are. We will determine 
by our standards who the saints are. I, I disagree with that. A saint is one who is holy. One who has received the Holy Spirit. One who believes in God and believes in Jesus. If you can do that, you are a saint. You have been given the status of being a saint. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Okay, what? What do you mean ministry? For the edifying, okay? The building up of the body of Christ. So that's what God poured out the Spirit upon. Jesus said, I give you gifts. These gifts are the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints so that you can do the work of the ministry until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Do you believe what I just said? Then you are a perfect person. I, Again, the English language is deficient when it comes to uh, distinguishing male and female. Man is man, whether you're woman or man. So, but it says, until you become a perfect man. That's, we are perfect. Not because we do anything, but because we believe that He did it and we accept what He did to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Does that leave anything out? Is there anything that the blood of Jesus does not cover? No. Looks like it pretty much does it. A perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And all of that is for those that do not believe. I said this, repent means stop being unbelievers and be believers. If you believe what I just told you is the word of God. From beginning to end, from Adam to Christ's return. All right, I want now, that's how the ministry of God works. And see, the, the church has said, you know, we're the ones who determine who the apostles are, who the prophets are, who the evangelists are, and we're going to ordain them. And, and, and the church out here has, has said, you know, that's not, we're all one body. Every denomination out there has certain rules that you got to live by to be one of us. But the body of Christ has one rule. Right here, the Word of God. And so we are determined to, de to assess what the Word of God says about us. Number one, ministry. Jesus gave gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But now I want to turn over to, and now let's turn over to Galatians, and 
we've talked about the ministry and what God gave for the church to be ministers. And ultimately, it's got to conform with the Word of God. In Galatians, in Galatians 4.16, it says, I say then, and again, what we're dealing with here is, what does it look like after 30, 40 years of the Spirit of God being in the church and the church recording all the stuff that has gone on. And that's what the New Testament, they've determined that this is what the, the Word of God is. And the canon is those books that show forth the blood of Jesus Christ from beginning to end. And so they've set about the New Testament in correlation with the Old Testament. And I've said the Old Testament is Christ concealed. The New Testament is Christ revealed. So we're going to see what it looks like to be the body of Christ. I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And I'm not going to get into the lust of the flesh. I'm just dealing with the Spirit and His working in us. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit. Your flesh is Flesh and blood cannot inherit eternal life. This body cannot inherit eternal life as it is. That's why you must be born again. Jesus explained it in to John 3.16. You must be born again. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. The law is dealing with the flesh. And the, and the law is essential to hold every human being accountable before God. You know the Word of God and the law, the Ten Commandments. Well, let's take them out of the schools. We don't want our kids to be indoctrinated with the Ten Commandments. And that's what the world has said. Anything that God makes as a rule, we're not going to let happen. And so the world is saying we're in control, not your God. That is the flesh. And in verse 22, Galatians 5.22, you need to know that without a doubt. That's a passage of Scripture you should be familiar with. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. If you do these things, you are Christ-like. We examine people's lives according to this. By the measure of your ability to look like this is determined on whether or not you are Christ-like. Our goal is to look like this. Love, joy, and peace. The kingdom of God is not meat nor drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And, and the Lord has shown me something. 
I told you about Israel's Pentecost. And Israel's Pentecost correlates with our communion today. Israel met with God. They stood before God and God gave them His Word. Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. This is 20, uh, Exodus 24.4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes. And then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in a basin. And half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, all the words that Moses that God had given Moses. And he read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Now that's the preliminaries for communion. All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. That's what you're saying. That's what Israel said. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Why would Moses sprinkle blood on the people? Well, he did that at the doorpost and the lentil when they came out of Egypt. The blood of the lamb. But there's nothing about the shedding of blood at Pentecost. But he says, this is the blood of the covenant. Who? That sounds familiar. Who said that? Jesus. Jesus held up the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Well, here it says, this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So Jesus identified with the old covenant promises. This is my blood, he said, that was shed for you. What Moses did is he held up my blood and sprinkled it over Israel. And all of Israel was made holy on the same day. 